All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm really, really like so super thrilled to have Peter Dads uh, give today's seminar. I've been actually a fan of Peter's work for decades now, and we've actually I seem to be following in his footsteps. You know, it'll be I'll start doing some work, and then I realize, oh, Peter has written actually a seminal paper about it. Everything from Peter is actually a Flint professor in mathematics. Uh, Natural and Technical Sciences at the University of Vermont. And this gives you a glimpse in the polymath abilities of his. Um, he's done research in everything from social influence and cultural markets, I'll talk about it in, in a second, to modeling network dynamics and spread of epidemics and contingents in networks. And now he's studying actually Twitter and, and uh, well, uh, expressed well-being and happiness being expressed with text messages on Twitter, which is also work that you know, we at ISI are doing um, heavily, uh, intensely. But to give you the little insight into about actually importance uh, and impact of Peter's work on the field. So he was actually one of the co-authors of the Silganic Dots Watts paper of 2006, Social Influence, culture, uh, how, trying to explain unpredictability of cultural markets, why some things become very popular or not. And I recently gave a workshop talk where I actually used the results of his experiment was part of my talk. But I wasn't the only one. There were actually at least one other talk that also directly used the, the, the results, the findings from that, from that paper in the talk. So you can see actually how this work that Peter has done has inspired many other research uh, directions and many other research work. So, and I'm sure this work will also be very inspirational for many of us. So I'm like very happy to, to, to give this opportunity to, for Peter to introduce his work to our uh, institute. Um, that, that was a lovely introduction and um, I will, um, so thank you so much. And it's really, it's a delight to be here. Uh, the first invitation I don't know when you guys reached out, but maybe maybe in April, and it was sort of maybe you, I could visit. And I was somewhat concerned that we, that would not be possible at that time. And, and I think that's, uh, yeah, so it's been borne out. Uh, anyway, uh, the pandemic will appear in, in this, in what I present you today, but we have separate work on that as well. Okay, um, so there's a lot in this title. Uh, what I really uh, I want to get to here is is turbulence of story, story turbulence, and and kind of trying to quantify how time has flown or crawled. And you know, leading up to that is what are the stories that are being told around any you know event or any in, in this case I'll, I'll frame it around Trump, but you know any major um, kind of uh, story. You know what are the, what how is it being talked about? What are the frames? Can we do that in real time? So I'll kind of close with a, a slide on that. You know, I think there's a science of stories that we're, we're all, you know, we've been moving towards for a long time in many different fields. Um, okay, so I have some quick kind of intro things. Let me make sure I'm on the right thing. Okay, this looks like it's functioning. All right, so this is gonna be the, the lineup here. I will talk about the fame piece because it's all connected into this and it's connected into stories. So I wanna kind of blend uh, what Christina was, mentioning just now, I want to blend that into my sort of biggest interest, I suppose, of the last um, maybe even 10 years has been, has been stories. Uh, but yeah, we'll get to this turbulent time thing at the end. Okay, so I have a cat, so that's, what, that's what's going on there. Um, okay, we do have this uh, complex system center at, at Vermont. I'm just gonna throw a few things up in front of you. And you know, I'm really interested in basic science being this, describe and explain, and it unlocks all of these other pieces here. Uh, we have a Roboctopus and we just do. Okay. And we've built an educational platform. Now we have a PhD that started a couple of years ago now. Uh, the framing is complex systems and, and data science. So it's like saying uh, geology is rocks and hammers, right? So it's a bit of metonymy. Um, and and this, it's been a really you know, great thing to kind of organically build over many years. It started with courses, then we had a certificate, then we had a master's, and now we have a PhD. Okay, my team. Uh, I work with Chris Danforth here. He comes from um, a chaos background, actually, um, at uh, Maryland, and and so we've been working for many years together. And we've got all these great students. Many of some of these have got some of these are our current students. Many of them are in, in uh, off in the world doing cool things. Some are in academic positions. Uh, many are in government or um, corporate settings as well. Very proud of those people. 
if you want to read some fun things about us, there was a piece in Outside Magazine a couple of years ago, which is just kind of enjoyable. All right. And uh, a last piece just to throw up at the start is I have these courses I built over, uh, well, 15 years now. Uh, Principles of Complex Systems, I'm calling them volume one and volume two, uh, but they sort of, they wind through all sorts of things. Um, and they've been kind of uh, research, uh, paper generators as well. So they're, um, they're good things. A lot of stuff online. I have all the slides online, <coughs> excuse me, and um, videos and things like that. So <coughs> hopefully useful resources. All right, so let's, uh, let's just sort of as a starting point, uh, so Christina mentioned that we worked on uh, measuring happiness. And I want to say, you know, there's a whole, there's a massive amount of stuff I can talk about here, but measuring happiness, what that really comes from is measuring meaning, right? And so this is older work in psychology. Um, Osgood and company in the 50s came up with looking at semantic differentials uh, as way of um, getting at meaning, right? And uh, I, think, I think what they ended up with something like 85 to 90 percent of you know, perceived meaning of whatever you were, you know, presenting to people uh, came down to three different semantic differentials. And one was valence, which is a happiness, sadness one. Uh, activity or excitement is another one. <clears throat> and then dominance, power, like how, how much power, do you, how powerful do you feel in, in experiencing something? So we frame this as happiness. We have this website, hedonometer.org. Um, and here it is, for example, so you can play around with it. It's an interactive thing. This is just, this is for Twitter. Um, we could look at, I'll quickly show you this. This is the, this is a day scale um, resolution of measuring happiness on Twitter. As, as I said, there's a lot we could talk about here, but I just want to quickly throw it up. We've never seen anything like we've seen this year. This is the drop around the COVID-19 pandemic becoming you know, a real global thing. It certainly was early on in January, but really becomes a big story. This is the day that Tom Hanks announced he was it sort of happened in 15 minutes. Tom Hanks announced he was he and his wife were um, COVID positive. Uh, NBA canceled its um, season or suspended its season, I should say. And uh, Trump gave a speech that kind of tanked the stock markets. It wasn't it wasn't a, a great 15 minutes. And for some reason, um, Sarah Palin was also on uh, the Mars Singer in a in a bear costume. So it was a really complicated 15 minutes. And um, anyway, so. That led to this drop, which we've never seen. And what, what we've seen drops like this, I suppose, but we haven't seen this kind of slow um, recovery, uh, which you see here. And then this is the murder of George Floyd. This, this sort of lowest point here is actually the Saturday, I think, after it, um, when the when the uh, protests were at the sort of initial strongest. Things have kind of climbed back out since then. Anyway, so this is a whole there's a whole world of stuff here, but you can see it's been somewhat going down since 2016. All right. We have a bunch of these interactive things online. You know, they're not, um, they're, they're okay, right? Like they, they function and we keep them together on um, those little bits of um, duct tape and stuff, but, but they work. And that website has a lot more. It has uh, books and movies and other things. All right, so what, what I'm trying to uh, show here is, this is again, this is this full timeline and this might be hard to see, but there are little red dots and blue dots here and the blue dots are Tuesdays and the red dots are Saturdays. So you can see a little bit more clearly here that there's this kind of jumbling if you look at the red dots, right? Um, so let me show you another piece here. So this is 2013. Uh, the Saturdays are the kind of high points in the week. So this is a strong weekly cycle. We've noticed this early on. Uh, it tends to sort of fall apart in the summer when people are you know, maybe not tied to work and school as much. And Tuesdays is kind of a low point rather than Mondays. And this is then 2019. And you see it's, you know, and I'm just visually showing this, right? So it's a little more messy and turbulent. Um, this could be all quantified, but it was this suggestion early on that the weekly cycle was coming apart, um, at least from this happiness measurement. Um, so that's an inspiration. I want to just point to this again, another whole big project. This is Story Wrangler. Um, it's a, um, a site, it's a data platform where you can look at n grams, one, two, and three grams for Twitter from 2008 to present, right? So it's updated every day. Uh, it's over, there's over a hundred languages. We used a, um, we used fa actually fast text from Facebook to do a better job. We have about 10% of all tweets going back to 2008. So it's just a, a, a resource. And we finally kind of um, put it together and cleaned it up. So this is a, there's an archive paper and, and you can check it out. And storywrangling.org is the website for that. So, but again, this is another place where we sort of, you can look at these timelines. Here's Black Lives Matter. Um, 
right, so which, which came to existence about 2015 as a concept, and, and there's this big spike around George Floyd's murder. QAnon, right, um, really pops up in the end of 2018. But you can sort of look at these individually and think, okay, there's some sort of like, what's the, how do we figure this out? You guys will know all these sorts of things, but I'll just quickly kind of touch on it. Um, what, I, what I would look at is, is fame by rank, right? We rank things everywhere, tennis players, songs, all these sorts of things. Uh, this is these papers ranked by uh, citations. This is an uh, article by Nature in, in, that appeared in Nature in 2014. Mount Kilimanjaro is in the background. This is every paper that had been published, just the, the first page, and they're trying to you know, actually make a physical thing where it's stacked. And you know, skewed distributions, we know these things well. Now, around about, this is not quite a half, but a half of the papers have never been cited, right? So there's a huge preponderance of, of, of papers with a zero. Uh, and then there's this really skewed thing. We know this sort of thing happens for wealth and, and various other things. And I'm not saying they're all power size, size distributions or whatever, but they're heavy tailed distributions. Uh, of course, words are a perfect example of this. And this is what we'll come back to for Twitter. So we have to think about these kinds of distributions a lot. And I will touch on what I call allo taxonometry, which is a detailed comparison of complex systems. It's a thing we sort of came together in the last year. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll touch on that later on. Okay, lots of, you can have lots of fun visualizations with this. Okay, right. So that's just gonna be a part of it. We, we, we have the skew distributions. We're gonna to have to worry about how they evolve and we're trying to you know, compare, if you like, you know, every day of Twitter to, to the previous day or to 10 days ago or to a year ago. How do you do that well? Um, you know, it's like, how do you compare a forest to itself and so on? I want to then, it, all of this is going to be wrapped into stories and I just want to give a few things here that, I, that I've been thinking about or that I've sort of um, tied together. So uh, just to start with some, some books that are floating around just to sort of see where we are. So th this is on the evolution of stories themselves. This is the point that we are storytelling uh, organisms. You know, we have lots of framings for ourselves, but I, you know, homo narrativus, I think is, 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 our, you know, is, is a really powerful way to think about how people behave. Uh, this is that stories, you know, have shaped civilization. I, I don't really like this book, but it's a, but you know, in, in, the, in, in principle, yes. Uh, that the economy is full of stories, right? That it's algorithmic really is, is, is the piece there. And I, I tend to sort of put all these things together. This is uh, uh, taking computer science and using that to give you stories, um, you know, get, using algorithms to give you ways of functioning in life better, right? So this is a self-help thing coming from computer science. And then this is going the other way, taking folk tales to explain um, computer science algorithms. Um, okay, so, you know, recipes and things. So stories are sort of, you know, everywhere we think about them. We can think about Instagram stories. And then I wanna say, you know, they, they, and, and these are not, you know, I'm not talking about bedtime stories, but I'm really talking about, you know, in a deep way, this is how people think about the world. It's a claim. Um, you know, we have all sorts of other little quirks and so I'm on, on it. Oh, uh, Siri, you scared me. Okay, uh, this, is, this is work by Cesar Hidalgo. Uh, it was a very interesting piece that he developed, um, maybe, maybe it's 10 years ago now, uh, but it, it's uh, taking Wikipedia and looking at how many, how many uh, languages that someone is, is written up in, right? So Jesus or Aristotle, many different languages of Wikipedia, there was an entry for them, um, but someone who might be just sort of famous in one, one language doesn't get spread out. So that, that was the simple idea. This is for Japan. These are people born from um, you know, 1900 on. And I'm gonna say that these people are storytellers of sorts. So even sports people, you know, they're, they're involved in this kind of spontaneous storytelling. And, and certainly that's the way we think about sports after the fact. Test cricket, I'm sure you're, you're thinking is a, the great example there. But um, yeah, all the, the, these are storytellers. And, and then there's this change over time. So this is up to 1400, next uh, 400 years, the 1800s and so on up to 1950, there's a sort of movement towards the more famous people becoming storytellers. And, and the most recent kind of accessing of storytelling would be the sort of a director of a video game, right? So we have directors of movies and directors of, of video games. It's very, you know, and there's people might debate whether um, uh, games are, are storytelling things, but yeah. One more piece about stories, just to sort of push, push, the, push the story along as it were. Uh, this is uh, from a study of uh, 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 hunter-gatherer people in the Philippines. That, that in that- Okay, uh, I found this. I, I'm gonna have to destroy this machine. Um, 
it's a it's a iPad that's very excited about itself. So, um, sorry, <laughs> shut off. Okay, uh, right. So uh, storytelling. It, so this is a ethnographic study. So storytelling is the most valued skill in this uh, for these people. You know, above hunting and so on, which might be sort of the simple thing you might guess. Uh, and the stories that people tell are pro-social norms, right? They're, they're about cooperation, about you know, helping the group survive. They are hard, and I'll come back to this, I suppose, but these are, these are hard stories for us to, to kind of grasp naturally. Um, and I'll come back to that. So you have to sort of tell them. Uh, there's a nice extra detail in here is that the best storytellers reproduce the most. So in fact, the stories keep going, right? The stories get reproduced, the ones that help the, the culture and the, the society, uh, but, and the, the people with the golden tongue, uh, as it were, keep going. Okay, so here's why I want to sort of tie this into the fame piece. This is not what we really had back in the day, but um, I think it's I think it's important. It's it's about storytelling. Right? So the most famous painting in the world is um, the Mona Lisa. Uh, I think most people, if you ask them, that will be the quick response they'll give you. And uh, but you know, in terms of prediction, it's, it's, it's something we think we can do, but when it comes to fame, uh, we're quite sure about the story of it, right? So the thing that's, that's most successful. So in this case, Harry Potter, I mean, when your book has become a Lego movie or, or enshrined in Legos, I suppose you're, you're, you're doing well. But, you know, there are 12 editors who, who dispatch this, right? And of course, those of us in science know that editors and reviewers are always making terrible mistakes about our beautiful work, right? So how, how, how does this fail? Um, uh, so there's that, the fall of uh, Eastern Europe was not, for whatever people might say now, but it wasn't really predicted, right? So how do these things happen? There's lots of, lots of work on this. Um, but let me just say some simple things. So we understand bushfires well, and I realize on the West Coast this is a terrible thing. I am, it may not be obvious, but I'm from Australia, and so this is a, you know, an enormous part of the, my background. Uh, we under, but we understand these things, right? That, that there's some ignition of these fires and that, that it's a system level story that the, there's, dry, the, there's been a drought for a long time or and there's enough undergrowth and whatever it is about a, a forest that it's ready to, to burn. So we know it's connected. Uh, so it's a system property issue. Uh, but we make, and I'm gonna claim we make, uh, for three reasons, we make what I'll say two mistakes about uh, social fires. Let me see if I can lay that out. So I, I tend to think about the social wild and, and uh, you know, stories spreading through the social wild, but we, we make these mistakes. And I would say, you know, it's kind of sitting right here, right? There's a match on the front of uh, Gladwell's book. And this is a very influential book back in the day, um, with, and it's sort of been gainsaid by academics and many other people. And, and Gladwell now has sort of started to say that he's a storyteller, right? He's not a scientist, but he's certainly been taken in that way. But this idea that there's a match, right? That this fire took off, and, and I'm leaving aside, you know, deliberate arson, but you know, you go back and find the match and hold that up and say that this match is really special, right? Missing the, the system story. And if it's raining, it doesn't matter how many matches you have, it's a system story. But we really like these, these uh, uh, we like stories in general, right? So, and so uh, this is my claim, we're homo narrativists, right? We will try to explain things with stories if we can. Certainly happens in sports all the time. It happens with, and this is this XKCD, which kind of captures a lot of this. Um, financial um, markets uh, have this, have this uh, thing going on as well. And I think the rollover zing for this one is that, uh, you know, most straightforwardly uh, Dungeons and Dragons, of course, is in fact built in this way. All right. Uh, let's see if this works. I know what this is. It's a lack of trust by Adobe, which is fair enough. I understand that. This might not work. Anyway, okay. So it's um, it's uh, Monty Python's uh, Life of Brian. So we are all individuals, right? So uh, the 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 we the narratives we tend to tell that we really enjoy and you know, both in fiction and in retelling real events. If you look at how journalists function, my wife is a journalist, I'm, I'm you know, and I'm trying to actually do a lot of work that helps journalism. Uh, there's a lot of efforts will be, you know, let's, let's, there's some massive thing happens, you know, there's an earthquake or whatever, and the story opens focused on one individual. You know, certainly we tell movies in this way. Um, it's much easier to think of a sporting team being one individual, you know, 
you know, maybe there is a dominant one, but it's just a much easier thing to, to package. Um, and we're certainly in that case now where we have, um, you know, Trump, for example, right? I mean, or, or in general, uh, the president of the United States is, is viewed in this way as having inordinate power. Um, and is it just an easier thing to, to talk about? Okay, there you go, that one worked. Um, that's the uh, Australian, that's a, the superb liar bird. Yeah, unfortunately imitating some real things. And that's the, yeah, all right. So we're good at imitating, right? And we, we're, the point is we're, with that little video is that we're rather impressed with uh, other species that, that imitate. And uh, we, you know, we'll, we'll write all sorts of news stories about that too. But um, we're, we're fantastic at it, right? So we're good at copying. And we copy others for good reasons, right? So we imitate what many other people are doing for safety, you know, just simply to be like other people, um, you know, just sort of as a sort of a core thing. But also, you know, if we think about it, well, they, you know, they, they must be right, right? If everyone thinks the Mona Lisa is great, it has to be great. And, and so it's a good example of where I think that comes undone if you've, if you've been there or maybe if you've read this book, uh, Becoming Mona Lisa or thought about it in other ways. Often the explanations for Mona Lisa, certainly, you know, when I was growing up, if I read about the Mona Lisa, it would be things about how the eyes followed you, that it's, you know, just this preternaturally incredible um, uh, experience if you're there. However, there were 400 years where it wasn't the number one or the most famous painting in the world, right? So it was sitting there and, and, and uh, um, Da Vinci's star kind of went up um, you know, with all these other things that he'd done being recognized more and more and, and it got elevated. Uh, so, you know, if you've ever been there, it's really disappointingly small. And I think that, um, you know, and of course I'm just saying this, but some people are a little bit surprised, uh, but it has, so it has this history and, and this is traced by Sassoon uh, that, you know, stolen, so there's a lot of news about it then, um, you know, it's hidden, it, it, there's all these sorts of things. There was some vandalism. So it's, it's, it's become famous and, you know, it's now the Kim Kardashian of, of paintings, if, you, if we can say that. So, but our, our, our bias is to think, of course, that it is amazingly great, that it, you know, and, and, and what this study that Christina um, mentioned at the start, you know, the thing to come away from it perhaps is that billions of people can be harmoniously wrong, um, which is tough, you know, because you can always say, they can also be very right about things as well. So it's complicated. And that's what this study was, right? We presented people with this market of um, um, uh, songs and, and, they, and people were allowed to listen to them and they could download them. And that was our signal that they liked it, right? So, uh, but we presented them in different ways. So sort of a weak signal where it's just this bit of a jukebox dashboard. Uh, and a strong one where it's ranked according to what people have done beforehand. Uh, and, and so the upshot of all of this was, and, and then there's this sort of business here where we um, cheated, right? So we had these rankings of songs, there are 48 songs, and we just flipped the, the, the list at some point and then traced what happened after that. And the downloads for the song that previously was terrible on the charts, now it's a here and it's, 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 it's taken off, right? It's taken off on here, that's what these lines are. Uh, so you can, you know, you can goose, this is payola, right? You can goose the system. You can, you know, pretend to be John Barron or something and say that you're a billionaire. You can do these and, and people are successful, right? You can have, you can make people think that um, this movie that's coming out is, is amazing um, by advertising, right? So it, it does get you a long way. But of course, the, what, what this shows, and I'll just quickly say, is that uh, the whole system performs poorly as a result. So you may win but everything is, is not functioning that well. And even in the case that you let everyone independently evaluate things, there's still gonna be, there's always gonna be following and you're always gonna end up with some path dependent world. So that's pretty weird. So that's just sort of a fundamental mistake that to, and that's to attribute the fame of something, the success of something to its intrinsic qualities, right? That it is just amazing by itself. I mean, chocolate's pretty good, people like that, okay. Um, but then, and I'll call it a mistake like this, you know, seeing, and, and you know, this is something I've talked about for a long time, but seeing that it's the social interactions, right, that you want to get at. And marketers have done this for a long time, although not, not as uniformly as you might expect, but there have been efforts to just get, you know, more and more with social media to get into people's social links and kind of, you know, influence those links or sort of profit from that. So I'm going to call it a mistake, but of course, it's actually a brilliant technique. Um, I know that you know, large corporations like Exxon use this to influence governments, essentially, right, kind of like moving in on, on um, government um, officials that are important. Uh, there are many, you know, many examples where this happens. 
this is Zuckerberg saying he's sorry um, many times over many years. Okay, so uh, right, and and this is this sort of just ties in with this other work that I did with Duncan um, Watts, um, just to, yeah, which is back at two thousands uh, when we were at Columbia together. You know, this is this old idea of how we thought or how theoretically at least um, you know scientists uh, thought that influence worked that the, you know, the advent of radio in particular and then TV, that people were just being influenced directly from this sort of one source. Uh, this is the 50s, actually, it's Katz and Lazarsfeld, the idea that, well, you know, there's some uh, heterogeneity in the population and, and let's sort of make it two, let's think of it in, you know, as two kinds of people, right? The ones who really listen to the media and then they tell all their friends. And, and if you go back to Katz and Lazarsfeld, they said, this is just a model. It's not at all what really happens, but this became, you know, now we have influences on Instagram and we pay the money and all those things sort of work, but it's not quite as potent. You know, the, there is this big messy business that's going on. People are communicating lots of different ways and very successful kind of, you know, this work has been studied by you guys, uh, you know, um, efforts to, um, you know, influence populations comes from this kind of grassroots approach, right? So the, the story seems to be coming from many different directions and that adds credence to it. Right. So there's a real version of this, of course, and then there's this more complicated way of, of messing with it. And of course, you want to do it at all levels, right? So if you have, you know, a, a leader who's telling you what's going on, but then you have sort of, you know, your average people telling you what's going on. And really, for th this is the story here, right? So that to, to get something to really spread properly, it's very, this is going to be a very naive thing I'm going to say. It's going to seem like that, but I, I think it's, it's hard for people to understand in some ways, is, you know, that you want average people out in the social wild um, taking this message and, and spreading it on. That's it, right? Of their own volition, right? They actually kind of enjoy it. They get some benefit. You know, jokes work like this, fashion works like this. But of course, political messages and, and um, you know, mes messages that end up in, say, civil war, right, work in this way too, right? So you know, stories, are, stories lead to all kinds of outcomes. Okay, I want to say just a couple more pieces here um, about fame. We have some nice things sitting in the words themselves. So fate uh, mean, you know, comes from Latin, means to have spoken, right? It's written, it's been written down, um, foretell, predict, right? These things are actually being, it's, it's determined, right? So it fits in with the, uh, you know, the, our common sense of it. Um, but really it's just the story of fate. I mean, there's, you know, there's all sorts of stuff we can talk about here, universality and, and under certain conditions, you know, the next thing is gonna happen. Um, but, you know, it's a probabilistic idea of destiny. Uh, but fame, fame has, you know, this, this livingness to it and it comes from to talk, right? So it really is about being talked about, right? So it's, it's, in, it's really in being talked about. Uh, and then there's some not, uh, other nice pieces like renown means to name again. So it's like retweeting um, and, uh, to, you know, to shout again, which actually has an origin in uh, lowing or the mooing of cows. All right. And then one, one more piece here, right? So, and this is, this will lead into, you know, this, this uh, more recent work. So, um, only one thing in the world uh, worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. So this is from the picture of Dorian Gray. All right, so, you know, and certainly this is well taken by uh, certain people and corporations, but it's just like getting, getting um, your name out there is, is sort of the first step. If you're a philanthropic organization, you know, brand aware awareness is huge, right? And you want the valence of that awareness to be, to be right, but just, you, you know, also you want to be talked about. All right, as we've all experienced, we've gone from this situation. So, you know, this work that I've talked about here was really in it. I mean, there was data, but um, we did experiments online. And, you know, we, we, of course, in some cases had, this is in the 2000s, we had, uh, you know, up to 100,000 people in some of our experiments, which was, you know, really enormous um, for a social science kind of experiment. Uh, but we've transitioned to uh, to data um, you know, just being everywhere. So this is well known. Um, okay, a couple of papers I'm just throwing up here for reference, but uh, this is this kind of, this is what I want to get to by the end of this, the timeline reconstruction um, of, of anything. It's going to be around Trump, but it's, it's a more general um, approach. I'm looking at things like story turbulence, narrative control, which is Trump specific, and then um, what I'll call collective chronopathy. Right, so this is the pathy in the sense of like empathy. So just the feeling of time, how time flows, but with that kind of touch of what pathy also con connotes 
um, of, of um, illness or disease, right? So yeah, this is, this is about is time flying or slowing down and last week seemed like a year or, and that, those sorts of things. You know, you see, I, I don't know if you, you may see this, uh, like I, I guess I'm aware of this and you, I, see, I see lots of little references to this all the time. You know, I'm someone saying, I'm gonna write an autobiography of my, the last 10 years of my life. It's called 2019. Right. Um, we have a couple of little pieces. We're just sort of developing this one. Let me see if I can get it. It's the, I'm gonna call it the Smogus dashboard. So it's not quite a dashboard, uh, but it, we're just sort of getting it to go. So this is a, a potosometer which we sort of had brewing for a long time. We'll come back to this, but this is Trump just being ranked. And this is to go back to the start of the talk, these ZIF distributions or rank distributions. This is the, the word Trump. So we're gonna do a very simple thing here and then we'll make it a little more complicated as we try to get to stories. It's just the word Trump. So it could be different Trumps, it could be cards, but it's gonna be dominated by, by Trump. This is from the start of 2019 through to today. Uh, and this is just, all of Twitter, all languages, the rank for the word Trump. So this is rank one down to a million. We'll kind of come back to these. But I, I've got God in here because I, we just noticed that God is very stable, actually. So I, and again, I'll show you some more on that. So it's just sort of a reference point. And um, so it's about 300, rank 300. So we call this this realm up here ultra fame. And you can see Trump is always, almost always in that realm. Uh, very rarely dropping down and never really going away. So Obama, which I'll show you in a little bit, you know, had, had all sorts of ups and downs. Uh, this is the debate day, uh, which was, oh, <laughs> it's hard to remember, but it's 10 days ago. I got that right, it's Friday. Yeah, so it's 10 days ago, the Tuesday. And, uh, you know, and then there's another spike when uh, Trump tests positive for corona coronavirus or COVID-19. And uh, Biden, has been building over that same time period. Uh, this is his all time or the all time high for this one gram, if you like, Biden uh, was, was the same, same day as the debate. Uh, Trump has higher points back in 2016. So we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll come to this, but I, just to show you that there's some things online. And, and this is another interactive piece here, right? So, well, interactive I say, but it's, a, it's a associated with this paper on, on the Trump stories. All right, so we've just looked at this one. Um, yeah, so this will be updated daily and uh, we will see what happens here. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with um, K-pop by now, although I, you know, I would have to explain this uh, in the past. Just looking at Twitter, it became clear that, that K-pop dominated, in particular BTS was, was this just enormous thing. So I was doing all these analyses of Twitter. I'm like, okay, okay. Fandom is huge and it matters. Um, but I, but I found it sort of a bit of a, a, a funny aspect of Twitter that, that, you know, made me kind of work on it in different ways. Uh, so I'll show you what we do with, with Trump. However, K-pop matters, right? I mean, it really, it, 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 uh, it started from government, from what I understand from uh, governmental efforts in the nineties to increase the cultural output of South Korea, you know, in some sense, they just wanted to, you know, strengthen that part of their society. Uh, and all sorts of things have come out of that, including K-pop as we, as we know now. So uh, the, the Tulsa rally, for example, for Trump is this, you know, there's this story that the TikTok uh, humans and um, uh, K-pop people really, you know, got involved with that. So they certainly have been, as a, as a group, it's an enormous fan base, have really uh, pushed other social um, uh, you know, platforms as well. So uh, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, actually a really powerful group. So there's a while there I was thinking, okay, they're having fun, but pretty serious. And it certainly changed the GDP actually of, of South Korea as well. So we were just here, I, I was pointing to some of this, I'm having trouble seeing this, but this is, this is the more recent stuff for Biden and, and Trump was here. This is the bigger view of how they've been talked about. Just this is the Oscar Wilde view, right? The, the, how, how much they've been talked about. And this is Obama has this kind of decent amount of being talked about over the whole span, hasn't really gone away. You know, this is McCain was very high early on, drops away, but comes back during Trump. Um, and his death is in here as well. Romney has these spikes now and then. The spikes are always Romney said something and then it's gone the next day. Uh, and there's Hillary's climb is, 
is, is strong and I'm using the names that were most dominant as a one gram. So unfortunately, th this sort of tracks with a more general thing that happens that women are called by their first name and um, men are called by their last name. So that's sort of the pattern here. Um, certainly Hillary's, Clinton is referred to as Clinton as well, but Hillary is the sort of the number one piece. But you know, a gradual decay here, but spiking up again. But as you can see, this is a sort of this extraordinary thing for Trump, right? So this is when he was talking about running. And this point here is actually the White House um, press um, uh, seminar thing. I've got the wrong word there, uh, the, the evening and uh, where Obama actually ridiculed him and so did Seth Meyers. And, and then he drops out of the running a couple of days after. So then there's sort of this decline and that's when he, uh, Trump announces he's running for the presidency and it goes up and up and up and uh, has stayed high. And as I said, this, this last point, the debate, and then the few days after it, the, actually the highest point of him being talked about, at least by this lens uh, in, in his whole um, time in office. Uh, overall, it's, it's actually the day after the election. For Hillary, it was the day of the election. Trump, it was the day after. So this is BTS is incredible sort of rise to fame for BTS. And then just sort of uh, some decay, but they've popped up again. But they're really in this top zone here. I and mean, this, is, this is actually fourth, was the fourth most common word, right? So uh, I have this on the next slide, but they're competing with basic function words, right? If you were advertising Coca-Cola and you wanted you know, Coke or Pepsi to be as common as the word is, you know, it would be crazy, right? You, no one would aspire to that, but that's what we see at least. And again, it's on Twitter, but still, it's, it's kind of amazing. Uh, th this is a comparison just on a linear scale of Trump versus Obama. And you see, as I said before, that Obama has a lot of sort of, you know, declines after being elected and then this sort of jumps around. Uh, but Trump is just like all the time, just 100% every day, there's no let up of, of being talked about. And I think it's, you know, I don't think there's any bias in saying that Trump wants to be famous, right? So he, he's, he's definitely achieved that um, in the last four or five years. These are histograms for those whole, whole time periods and the sort of interesting, there's some extra annotations here. You know, kind of, I've just sort of added countries here to give you a sense of, give people a sense of, you know, how, um, how various points, um, you know, say the median, for example, for Obama is kind of tantamount to the UK. Uh, but when you're above this, got this level here, when you're in the top 1000, there are no countries above that. The US is sort of the top country in terms of frequency of usage. So now we have to sort of move, we move to um, frequency, uh, to function words. And so Trump made it to 11, and that's where the word is normally is. Hillary made it to 50, that's where the word was normally is. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's actually uh, BTS got up to, to um, three, which is where the word two is. So obviously that's fans driving things, but it's, it's, it's still nevertheless, absolutely amazing, I, I think. Uh, Trump has in the last four years been much more like the word because. And that's the level of being talked about. So this again, this is just a raw fame thing. I have a couple other pieces in here. Okay, I have a couple of other pieces in here that, um, let me shrink this little thing. Yeah, uh, this is ultra fame. So this is the percentage of days that uh, uh, the, these, these one grams here are being ranked above um, uh, 300, where God is, the median rank for God. Uh, and you see actually, Right, so this 2016 has Trump, you know, part of it is him taking off. But once he's uh, in office, very, you know, it's in the 90s, but this year it's been 100%, talked about it all the time, right? And we'll, we'll sort of track that history in a little bit, but, you know, it's really been extraordinary and in fact has made it in front of BTS. BTS has actually fallen out of the top 100% in that time. And if you look at, you know, Biden, you know, hasn't, well, we'll have it on this next one, I think. This is, this is also something that's updating every day on the potosometer, um, and we only have 31 days here, but each of, each of these columns is the 56 days leading up to the election, and it's the median rate of being talked about, right? So we're gonna set a baseline of a thousand Obamas. So you read all these tweets that are coming to you, and you're counting up Obamas, and every time you get a thousand, how many you know, uh, McCain's do you expect? And, and so here it was, it was about 750 to a thousand, right? So it's sort of a four to three ratio. Uh, against, uh, you know, in the 2012 election, Obama's talked about much less relative to what, what it was. And of course, Twitter's changed a lot. So there's some complications there, but within the columns, it's a reasonable comparison. Romney-Obama, actually much more comparable. 
and Trump versus Hillary, and you see Clinton does pretty well as well, it's about two to one, roughly. And you, you see now Trump is you know, up here and his email, uh, sorry, his, email, his Twitter uh, handle is, is, is enormous as well. It was an old thing to say, email. Um, anyway, so, so 370 for Biden. So this is, you know, th he's, at least in this kind of volume, Trump is being talked about a lot. And I, I'm not adding opinion or, or those things. We have, we have some other work on that. And, and only today, I just really want to get to stories, not so much opinion. Okay, so, so uh, Biden is sort of kind of clocking as much as, as Hillary and Clinton did uh, back here, but Trump has gone, you know, it's being talked about more and more. Okay, so there are more of these relative rates per year. And again, this is Trump, just, just really you know, astronomical numbers. Uh, I'll just quickly point this out. Uh, you may have played around with these things, right? So we'll call it uh, ratio metrics. Uh, looking at uh, the balance of um, replies, retweets, and um, favorites on Twitter, right? So, sort of the three actions you can take. Twitter's changed how you can do that and how easy it is over time. But this is over a decent period of time looking at and, and its replies here, retweets, and likes or favorites, right? So, you can see this sort of big change with the election for, for Obama, right? So, he's getting more and more likes as it goes along, some modest changes but then he's just not being interacted with as much at all. Um, Trump, you know, there's a big change for him as well. Uh, but again, somewhat, somewhat steady. He's, he's, his replies are maybe a little more spread out, maybe. Uh, but certainly there's just more volume here as well. You, what you can do with this is, is kind of um, compare, you, you, we can plot this sort of ternary plots and, and look at them over time. Uh, celebrities are, tend to be right down in this corner, right? They're, they're favorited enormously. Um, but they're not spread as much. Uh, if you look at Republican senators, 538 did an analysis of this, they're much more spread out over the whole thing. Lindsey Graham kind of gets smashed out over here. And I guess I haven't said this, but you know, the more replies you get, and we've done some other analyses, other groups have done this, but if, if you're down in this corner, it's not a good thing. People aren't spreading your message. They're writing back to you. Maybe that's good if you're you know, a famous person, but generally speaking, if your replies are outweighing these other two corners, then uh, people are mad right? They're, they're, they don't like you. So, well, they don't like what you've said. Uh, so, um, Trump certainly has, if, if you look at this, Trump has managed to get into this, right? So, there are some of these little uh, triangles out here. So, this, these are pretty extreme. Obama has stayed in this pocket, uh, but early on in his, his uh, he was more, you know, people were spreading things more. He was more on this axis here. Things are being spread. Okay, so that's a whole other piece. I'm just going to give one slide of this. It's going to look too complicated, I know, but this, the idea is there's a zip distribution here for the words being used. And in this case, it's uh, the, the day, the Sunday of Charlottesville, right? So it's uh, the day that Heather Heyer was um, uh, murdered. And um, it's really the day after the, it, it's sort of in the, the, the ensuing part of the, the Saturday's events. Uh, and this day is the election, the day after the election. So this, Funny looking thing, it's a histogram in log space that shows you how well these words match up, right? So words along here, for example, these are words that are not used um, uh, on this day, but are used on this day. So Shvetanovich, uh, this name, it took me a little while, I, I just didn't search, but it's not a soccer but it's, one, it's the name of one of the people um, who were on the Unite the Right, um, sort of in many of the pictures holding one of the, the flames. Uh, but you see these names, Charlottesville, Hare, and so on, right? These are names that appear much more on this side than they do on this side. And over here, you see Hillary and, you know, weird things like Harambe is over here because people said they wrote in Harambe, the gorilla for president and Trump. So there are contour lines on here and there's a whole thing, but there's a whole uh, world of stuff that uh, we've built out over here, which is, if you're, if you're familiar with divergence, like um, Jensen Shannon divergence and so on, it's a, uh, an expansion of that. And it's an expansion of that kind of idea to ranks as well. So not, it, it goes beyond probability distributions. But this is a very fine-grained way we, we, we developed to try and measure, okay, um, the difference between words being used on a day and, a, and another day so that we could have sort of a through line to measuring um, what I'll call chronopathy. So we use this, one of these instruments, uh, and I'll call it ranked turbulence divergence, uh, because this idea of turbulence in the, in the zip distribution, the word usage, right? Even though the zip distribution, if you're familiar with these things, may look exactly the same, but all these words are churning around in, in terms of usage. 
So we'll take uh, this is this this for just sort of focus on this line. This is every line is a um, a, a day, and uh, we're, what we're doing is we're comparing all the words being used around Trump, right? So we find every tweet that has Trump in it, and that includes retweets of Trump, and looking at a year before and looking at the turnover, right? Looking at which words are new in this year. And so this is, the, if you zoomed on these, you'd see the top 10. Uh, the, we'll call these the most narratively dominant words. We take this out and we, we take the most narratively dominant, dominant word at day scale, and then we move to the, uh, the, the week scale here. So let me maybe, okay, I'll, I'll zoom in on this a little bit. So this is most narratively dominant one gram around Trump 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20. And so you can see this kind of texture of, of everything leading up to the election, right? So crooked is here, Hillary. So this is crooked, Hillary. And these bars here, there's a, and the number 80.6, they indicate what fraction of um, the usage of that word is actually due to a, just simply a retweet of Trump. This doesn't capture everything, but this is what we'll call um, narrative control from, from, from Trump. So you can see this is, you know, people echoing Trump enormously. And so these are really his biggest points where he did, he, he was able to get this, 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 whatever he was saying to be retweeted. You see, um, right, so Clinton, Bannon, Hamilton, you know, there's all this kind of, if you can remember these things, inauguration comes up in that I have two grams on the next page, which will help. So these are kind of keywords in a way, you know, we could do topics, but I'll show why we're not doing that. Um, just because we want to have everything connected. Uh, but you see there's a Russia appears now, tax, um, Comey, Right, Mueller's going to pop up. Charlotte, North Korea, Charlottesville, the Boy Scouts, Hurricane Harvey. So this is one way. It's at the weak scale. It's one way of trying to be able to create a computational recording of you know, the top ten words or the top hundred words at each day, and and that's powerful as well. You see, Mueller starts to dominate. So we start to see things kind of slow down a little bit because there are these pieces like Kavanaugh becomes very dominant. Um, Bill Barr is here a lot, um, and then Ukraine and impeachment, right? So that becomes very kind of stuck. Uh, Greenland, right? So that's last August, if you can remember when that happened. Uh, there's also children, so this is referring to um, children in cages, you know, and space forces in here, right? How do you how do you kind of remember all these things? So uh, the start of this year, just to let's just let's just see if we can go through that. Iran and Soleimani, right? So this is the assassination of Soleimani. Uh, the Iranian general. Then we're back to impeachment. Uh, this Bloomberg is involved because this is somewhat, but coronavirus comes in and Trump really, even though he uses other terms to refer to it, these are, this is the word that's attached to him the most, right? So this is the dominant word and there's nothing, there's been nothing like this. Uh, you know, that should comport with your experience, but time really slows down here and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, Okay, there's a, there's a little bit where some retweets of his have coronavirus in it, but really he is not in control of this. And Minneapolis, so this George Floyd um, the, is murdered and this so all the ensuing events, this becomes something for him to really talk about. He doesn't talk about Russian bounties, um, talks a little about Russian, but coronavirus comes back. It's like the, you know, the monster at the end of the movie just keeps coming back. Uh, you know, so Portland was, was a good talking point for him. Uh, the post office didn't really refer to at least as USPS. Uh, then we see um, Wisconsin is here, the Atlantic story, Woodward's piece, and coronavirus comes back. This this refers to Trump getting COVID, and th and this is just the start of this week, so this may may change. It's the virtual debate. Uh, but looking at two grams, which can give you a different feel for things, you know, the coronavirus dominates. Um, mask pops up. This is the photo op, right, um, with the tear gas. Uh, event. Uh, Joe Biden is kind of dominant as a two gram. Different things pop up potentially from one grams and two grams. Supreme Court, Supreme Court, Walter Reed, extraordinary thing. You know, if you go back in time, you're seeing things like Stormy Daniels uh, and, and all these pieces. I do want to quickly zoom out. Um, this is at the, the day scale, right? So this is the same kind of thing that I showed you. I'm just going to zoom through it a little bit. But just on the right hand side, so this is 2020. This is back in February 24th. And if you come down, you just see coronavirus every day. Uh, pandemic pops to the top, Fauci at the top here. Michael Flynn gets back up to the number one, but coronavirus, coronavirus. And then, you know, he's talking about hydrochloroquine, taking it. 
and, and then starts the, the absentee vote thing. But then it starts to start to, to break and you see this, right? He's trying to get Twitter in trouble, but this is uh, George Floyd's murder. Um, and you, you, you'll, you'll, you know, if you see this in ramp, for example, um, so, you know, how do you remember what happened? But, um, and Jelaine Maxwell, not talked about. Okay. Uh, and I do want to show one more here. So if we do this, this is the top 10, right? Again, it's just sort of zooming out. This is the top 10. So one line is just a date. Uh, and just, just to show what happens here, here's coronavirus, right? It's dominating. And you can see these are Trump terms in here, right? He's trying to talk about mini mic, uh, the flu, uh, talking about, you know, um, vaccines and things. China is mentioned here. So, the, you know, this is the number five word on that day but it's not working. This is Liberate Michigan, right? But coronavirus stays at number one, but you can see this effort to change the narrative, Obamagate, right? It's trying to smash the, the narrative. And I mean, I'm framing it that way. And I think he gets close, but he doesn't make it. All right, let's uh, finish this up. Uh, you can go and look at time series then. You, this is a way of finding out what the dominant pieces are. This is looking at time series. Here's Crooked Hillary, for example. So this is exactly how much frequency, you know, the frequency around Trump the orange on the pot on the bottom is how much of it is due to his tweet. So you can see that this is really, you know, he's dominating this. Trump is dominating fake news. When it's around him, it's really him tweeting about it. Witch hunt, same thing. But then coronavirus, there's nothing going the other way, right? Um, Joe Biden, he talks about for sure. Impeachment, not so much. Jelaine Maxwell, not so much. So this is sort of one of these smorgas dashboards, and, and you can check that out later on. Okay, so this is the last piece. I realize I'm using up my time. No, this is the last piece. So I'm just going to try to explain this. Uh, so so um, yellow, the, the lighter color means uh, further apart, uh, you know, more change, and uh, the darker color means less change. So this is, this is for all of January comparing to a day before, two days before, three days before, out to a year before. So what we do is we take each day in January and we compare it some delta days before, and then we you know, merge all that together. So we're going to do this at the month scale going across and here all the years. And what you see is, you know, it, it makes sense early on that Trump, you know, there's a huge amount of change in, in things, right? He's, he's running, he's, he's succeeding. Then things start to slow down, right? Here's the election. 2017, though, is pretty fast, right? There's a lot of lighter color here. And this is indi indicative of memory not holding, right? So because you've had North Korea, you've had Charlottesville, uh, you've had a Hurricane Harvey and then... Um, Hurricane Maria and, and stuff is just being forgotten, right? There's so much going on in here. Things start to slow down and it's kind of 2018, 19, even though these stories are churning over, the way they're churning over doesn't really change too much. And then 2020 is completely different. So what we have here is, this is April, is an incredibly slow month, right? So this, for example, is 28 days. So 28 days in and 14 days in April seem very slow. And in fact, that's the slowest two weeks. And again, that doesn't mean the whole of those two weeks. It just means if you were in one of those weeks in April, one of those days in April, and you thought about two weeks ago, if you could go back and compare to what were the stories two weeks ago. So it's all coronavirus all the time. George Floyd's murder um, leads to this massive change here. But then that all gets enfolded. And then we have this slowdown again through the summer where it's Black Lives Matter and the coronavirus, and they're just all sticking, right? There isn't this turnover of story. And as I kind of tried to show you on that previous piece, Trump, in my mind, is trying to sort of smash it. October, there's been a lot of turnover. We'll see what happens as, as time goes on, how this kind of averages out, but there's been a lot of turnover. So you see this October is just exploding. Right, so one way to, to kind of look at that is to say, well, let's take as a benchmark 14 days in April. Uh, if I get that right, yeah, 14 days, so two weeks in April. So how does that feel in terms of, you know, if you go back to all these other months, so for the amount of turnover, and these are estimates, the amount of turnover in 14 days in April felt like basically two days back here, right? So we'd have this new cycle that's going sort of churning over, churning over, churning over. And here it just completely slows down. It slows down a little bit again here, but again, you, it's, it, time is very, very nonlinear and complicated thing to, you know, so you have to do these anchors and, and, and make these comparisons. If we go and say, what about 56 days in May? You know, so now we're looking at eight weeks ago, then actually it's really these months start to seem very slow because they start to feel like March, 
and April, right? So they're starting to, you know, uh, August is starting to feel like six months before or, or four months before. So there's a, there's a slowness to them, but again, October really, you know, really fast. So what, we, what felt like eight weeks in April, again, by this measure, feels like three days so far in, in October. And this is just another one of these kind of ways of looking at it. But uh, this is quite slow in six months. Uh, it was very slow in, in, in August because it's starting to seem like February. Uh, coronavirus has become the dominant story again. Okay, last piece I just wanted to, I'm just gonna throw this up here, but basically science of stories, um, we're coming at it from lots of different directions. Uh, you know, we need to build the instruments. We need to measure things well. Um, I, I perhaps haven't emphasized as much, but I do think, you know, the onus is on us as scientists is do what everyone has done in the past. You know, we invented thermometers. We, uh, we figured out measuring time really hard, really hard. It took us a long time to, to get those instruments to work. So we just have to really work very hard on, the, on getting our data sorted out. You know, Twitter's a strange thing, but you know, we, have, we have to work with it work with that and work with all these other sources and kind of make sure they all match up. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the end. Um, I realize I've managed to go right to three and I've had <laughs> the zero feedback. So I hope you're still there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. This was, that was perfect crystallization in, of, uh, of what we are experiencing right now with the Delta Express right now. I'm going okay. to have a few minutes left couple minutes left. I would like to open, uh, see if anybody has questions. Is it Justin? Thank uh, Well, if anybody can unmute themselves and ask a question. If not, I will, uh, I will take a thing. So this was really fascinating uh, and I look forward to talking to you later today. But what kind of data did you use to measure this? Was this the 10% the, the sample? Was this the fire hose? Uh, it, it's 10%, it's yeah, it's 10%. 10%. And, and, and I worried a lot about tail problems that led to that whole development of this allotax, what I'm calling allotaxonometry. But so we can, we can talk about that. Yeah, but the tail is, is, a, is a worry, but yeah, so 10%. 10%. So have you given much thought about how any kind of, you know, biases from the data from the sample might affect the results? Yeah, and I know you guys have some work on this. Um, uh, no, so, so no, really worried about that. But I, I'm, I'm going to say that because we're focusing on these, well, generally very well talked about things that, that that's kind of cleaned up. The problem to me, and it's the same with the hedonometer stuff and all these other things, the problem is really in the lens itself. Like just, you know, we could, we, we've, we've tried to do, ex be very careful with Twitter, for example, but, you know, moving to another data source would be the, the piece. And we do have some like Media Cloud and Reddit, for example, like that, that's the, that would be the piece that would perhaps help. Okay. Uh, I, I will say one, one really good thing that's in Twitter, of course, as we all know, is retweets. So you have this, you have this built in like fame piece, which you don't for say Google Books, very, very problematically, Google Books doesn't have sales. Yeah. Right. Uh, Daniel has a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was it was great. I I was specifically impressed by by these graphics that you had, like with the with the general response versus the response for for different for example for Donald Trump regarding different topics. And I was I was wondering if 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 you have considered studying like well, maybe it's because it wasn't clear to me, uh, like, are these the response from him to different uh, Twitter threads or Twitter topics or, or vice versa? So um, I'm trying to determine whether there is a causality, maybe he is the one manipulating everyone or oh, yeah. the environment is the one reacting him to tweet about that, right? So we, we, we have some work on that. Um, it's still... Yeah, we, we have some work on it I, and I'm not, we, we, it's not quite at a paper thing, but exactly that question, right? So how much is he driving? And yeah, no, I think that's, it's absolutely perfect. I mean, I think we get a little bit of this with the narrative control, right? You can see how much of it is just something that's associated with Trump is, is being echoed from retweets of him. So a, we've got a bit of that, but in terms of like the bigger piece, like you know, is everyone now talking about, you know, like a day after Trump tweets something is now, has that moved the narrative 
uh, you know, in, in some dimension. I will say like the, he sort of lost track, you know, the narrative recently has just been all over the place, right? The, the story thread has just been like just flapping. And I mean, just to say the possibilities, I mean, he could have gotten really sick and, and died and, and, you know, and, and, or he could have really had minimal, just, it's just, <laughs> you know, so, so I think he kind of lost control there, but I, but I, I think it's doable and I think it would be very important. No? Um, all, like um, regarding the fake news, it would, I think it would be very interesting to see whether, um, whether he manipulates them, introduces them, amplifies them, or just reacts to them. I, I think for me that uh, maybe, maybe actually just looking at Donald Trump is, is very good <laughs> like indicator to know whether uh, something is fake or not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I mean, some people would say that. I know, is it, um, I think it's KP Morgan has a, uh, they developed, maybe you guys know this, they developed some sort of metric based on Trump's tweets for volatility or something, I think, which is an interesting thing to produce. Um, yeah, I. he's also re tended to retweet more as well. And we've tried to kind of track that because, you know, he's like, what, what is he retweeting? What is, what is he amplifying is really an important part. I think it's, I think it's, it's doable. I mean, you know, Twitter is so rich that you can, I, th I guess some uh, trap for me is like, you, you know, you can quantify things really well, right? So, but then you have to step back out and say, well, how much does it reflect the real world? And I'm going to say that it, it does a pretty good job in terms of basic news. It's all enfolded um, with the news. <laughs> it's a great question. Thank you. All right. Um, we have run out of time, um, um, but there's, I, I guess the spots are already, slots are already filled up. So uh, you have a few more hours of one-on-one -on -one talks. So, but let's, uh, but thank you so much for giving this really, really fascinating talk. So um, thank you. And uh, I'll, thank I'll talk to you. you. Yeah. I'll talk to you later in, uh, in the afternoon. All right, thank you. Okay, Great. bye. Thanks everyone.